Okay, today's topic is somehow about uh, um, about language. Language, okay. Because the language is very unique. That uh, it's a very important tool mm -hmm. or technology mm -hmm. in mankind's history, mm -hmm. and maybe it is one of the most important reason that we are different from other species. I agree. And you can see the language you can use to keep your knowledge and yeah. pass it down to the next generation. Yeah. And there's there are also research about uh, civilizations yeah. which last long and prosper and they got a very good language system. Yes. They can yeah. preserve the knowledge. Yes. And they can uh, give it down to the next generation. But also we can see uh, so many small community yes. in the, uh, on the islands, they are not developing very well yes. because one of the reasons is they are not using the language very good or their language <coughs> may be very simple. Do you, do you know how the Inca Indians, who had a great em empire in South America... Yeah, they used to. You know how they kept their... you know what their form of writing was? Uh, I, I don't know the details. Well, they had sticks. Okay. And on the sticks they hung down strings. Oh. And on the strings they tied knots. And the knots oh. meant something. Oh. Uh, and they had warehouses where these sticks with the strings and the knots were stored. Yep. And then they had people in charge of different parts of it. And the person in charge had to know what all the knots meant. Ah. Oh. So he could touch the knots and go down and repeat the record that was okay. there. And then he had to teach someone else who taught someone else. So, uh, but it also means power. I think. Oh, I think so. Well, and also, I think you could think how you think how you could uh, change what the knots mean a little bit if one of your relatives was involved. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, uh, as we know. That's the the knowledge is power is very uh, very famous. Yes. But when you translate it, then in Chinese. Yes. There are different ways into the translation. Yes. The you can translate it like the um, knowledge is strength. Knowledge is strength. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can also uh, translate it like the knowledge is what you know. Yeah. What you know. That yeah. I think what you know, yeah. or what you understand, or the yeah. or information this time is better than strength. But still, yeah. the now the most popular translation in Chinese is the uh, the knowledge is strength. Knowledge is strength. Strength. The power, because you can translate it into strength, or you can translate it into authority, or you. I think the best translation is the knowledge is authority. I see. Yes. Yes. Oh, I like that the best too. Knowledge yeah. is authority. I like that because knowledge has the authority to convince us, to persuade us, to yes. move us. Yes. It doesn't have a power like a gun has power. It's a different kind of power. Yeah. Oh, Even Napoleon agreed that. Yeah. He mentioned the blade yes. and the pen. And yes. he, he think eventually the pen will prevail. Yes. Yeah. Well, it happened with him because his form of government is most alive mm -hmm. uh, today through the civil code. Yes, exactly. It's what he wrote. It's not what his armies did, but what he wrote. That has yeah. lived the longest. Yeah. Now today, his campaign has only meaning in the military school. Yeah. But the civil code is very well known. Yeah. Yeah. And some noble writer yeah. sometimes want to find some sparkles or find some uh, feeling when they yes. cannot write something, then they just read the civil code. Yes. But they, they, they will, I think they will read the French civil code instead of German civil code. Yeah. That's different. Yes. The German is more, German civil code is more complicated. Yes. Yes. That's very unique. So how, how do you think about, as we know, the law is the, a, a type of language, a yes. very unique chain in the law school on this planet. Normally then, there are so many jargons that only know by the lawyers. Yes. So, What's, what do you think about this type of language? Okay, well, there's a lot to be said about uh, language in the law. Uh, one thing to be said is the, the special language of the law, 
what you're talking about. The, exactly. techni the technical terms in the law and their technical terms in law are very interesting because mm -hmm. they tend to use ordinary words yep. but to give them special meanings. Yes. And the special meanings have to be found through cases. They can't simply be understood as an abstract formulation. You have to know, mm -hmm. you have to be taught the case in order to know the meaning of the concept. Exactly. So I think this is a, a, it's a good device to use ordinary language that suggests the technical mm -hmm. meaning because mm -hmm. one of the most important things about law is that most people, mm -hmm. particularly businessmen, should be able to obey the law without studying the law. Mm -hmm. That's to say that their, their moral instincts about what's right and wrong should be sufficient for them to stay within the law most of the time. Right. Oh yes. They don't. They don't. They don't when they when they when they're negotiating a deal, mm -hmm. it's very important that they don't have to get all the legal facts right first. Mm -hmm. It's very important that they they know roughly what they can do and what they can't do mm -hmm. intuitively, because the transactions cost the burden of mm -hmm. learning the law is very large. Yes. So ideally, the businessmen mm -hmm. figure out what they want, and then they tell the lawyers who figure out mm -hmm. technically what's required in terms of a contract mm -hmm. or a organizational form and then they come back to the businessman and they get it right. Mm -hmm. Now that's, you, you can't do that if the law doesn't, if the ordinary language mm -hmm. of morality doesn't relate closely to the language of the law. Mm -hmm. So for example in contracts we have this, mm -hmm. we have the formulation that a promise is enforceable exactly. if there's offer, yeah. acceptance and consideration. Yep. You know, offer and acceptance, sir, they mean just exactly what they mean in ordinary speech. I think that offer and acceptance is very somehow universal. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And it, of course, there, there's always going to be technical questions, like suppose somebody makes an offer by mail. Yes. And then they want to rescind the offer. Yes. When can they rescind the offer and when can they not? Mm -hmm. Ordinary morality isn't going to tell you that. The cases are going to tell you that. Exactly. But nevertheless, that's, that's not usually what's going to happen. Usually the person's going to make the offer and there's the offer and there's no, not mm -hmm. a question about one offer versus another. Mm -hmm. You know what the offer is and you understand that it's like a promise, that if someone makes an offer mm -hmm. and someone else accepts it, then there's likely to be a legal consequence. You don't have to study law to know that. Yep. So it's very important that the law track our ordinary speech and that's one of the things I love about the law because really good lawyers can write so clearly mm -hmm. in ordinary words. Yep. You know, you read it, you're not a, if you're not a lawyer, you read it and you think you understand it, you don't really understand it because yep. you don't know the cases. They got a, but that's very special in the common yeah. law system. Yeah. And now we know that today that somehow the common law and the civil law system are combining with yes. each other. Yes. And we can see that in the United States, you also yes. got the making law. We do. In your Congress. We do. And we also have all this, these codes. Mm -hmm. We have yeah. lots of codes. We, yeah. we have codification of the, civil, of the common law. Yep. So the, but my, actually I'm thinking about that. Do you think that's a good thing that ordinary people can hardly understand actually um, what all these jargons and the sentence in law means? Well, one of the, one of the advantages of the jury system, mm -hmm. of deciding cases by jury, as in, in the United States, just so everyone knows, in the United States, if either party requests a jury, then mm -hmm. there must be a jury. Mm -hmm. If neither side requests a jury, then mm -hmm. there can be a trial just with a judge and no jury. Mm -hmm. Now, in Europe, mostly the jury has been um, eliminated, mm -hmm. except in, say, very serious crimes. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the advantages of having, of keeping the jury is that it forces the language of the law to be understandable by ordinary people. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, the judge is going to have to explain to the jury mm -hmm. what the law, what the law requires relative to the facts of the case. Mm -hmm. And the jury is going to have to understand it and make a decision. Mm -hmm. So that means that you can't hide mm -hmm. the law in 
into the in elites. technical yeah you can the, the elites can't keep can, the law. can keep the law for themselves yeah yeah it's it, that, that's an attractive feature and it cha it, it changes scholarship mm -hmm. see economists write for each other mm -hmm. and that's why the language is so hard it's so hard for ordinary people to understand yeah of course so uh, economists don't have the discipline of having to write mm -hmm. for ordinary people mm -hmm. If you're in the university, you can just write for other university mm -hmm. economics professors. Mm -hmm. But in law, you can't do that if you want to be important. Okay, I understand that you try to find some balance between the uh, the elite knowledge, elite knowledge yep. for elite, yep. that the ordinary people can understand yep. it. Yeah. But as we know, that the lawyer's fee is very high. Yes. <laughs> so here's the <laughs> unique part. Okay, you understand it, but still, I, I charge you a lot. <laughs> well, you know, the law, law is, is special. It's like medicine in this respect. You mm -hmm. go to a doctor uh, mm -hmm. when you're sick, mm -hmm. and you pay a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It's very expensive. Mm -hmm. And then later, either you get well or you don't. Mm -hmm. And very often, you never know whether the doctor made you well or not. <laughs> He might have it, he might not. Not only does he have technical knowledge mm -hmm. that he can't explain to you in advance, mm -hmm. but he also does something to you mm -hmm. where you can't tell whether it worked or not. The law is the same way. Mm -hmm. You go see a lawyer, you have some dispute over, say, taxes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the lawyer is going to have to tell you what the laws are on taxes. You can't understand it yourself. Of course not. Then you're going to do something in the court, yeah. and maybe you're going to win, and maybe you're going to lose, and you're never going to know for sure whether the lawyer yeah. did a good job or a bad job. So the this is information asymmetry in economics. The, the, yeah, exactly. the information asymmetry between the expert and the purchaser of the service is very large in law, as it is in medicine. How can you prevent the moral hazard if, as we know that, like lawyers and doctors, that they got their unique language? They yes. have their unique training, and they would like to tell you that, oh, you cannot understand that. That's years of training. Yeah. It's all my techniques. You just... Yeah. But here, here, here is the question. There's yes. that's also a very important question in law and economics. That when you got the maybe possible moral ha hazard problem. Right. As we know that, uh, you know, some lawyers, they sometimes you can make an agreement to settle it down. But they yeah. said, oh, they are so bad. Go yeah. to the court. There are many lawyers because they want to make some make income, more money. make more yeah. money. They yeah. prefer to tell the party, yeah. go to court. Yeah. But so here, do do we have yeah. any possible uh, theory to uh, to create a mechanism yes. to reveal the information? Yes. Well, I think there are uh, there are various systems of mm -hmm. payment yep. for lawyers. You can have mm -hmm. pay by the hour, or you can pay by the individual service, or mm -hmm. you can have a contingency fee where you get a share. Yep. And they all have different properties with respect to mm -hmm. the incentive that it creates, mm -hmm. or in your terminology, the moral hazard that it tends to cause. Yep. Um, and I think that it's very valuable for all mm -hmm. students of the law mm -hmm. to study the economic theory of contracting mm -hmm. with lawyers to understand these properties. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that in general, the most general level, I think there are, there are, there are two mechanisms yep. that you use to try to make, to try to solve the agency problem. The agency problem is the fact that the lawyer is the, your agent. You're the principal. Mm -hmm. You hire a lawyer. The lawyer is your agent, mm -hmm. and the agent's interests are not the same as your interests. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you get them aligned as best possible? And I think there's two uh, basic mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And the f the first mechanism is universal. It's used everywhere, and that's mm -hmm. reputation and relationships. Okay. Right. You want to have a you want to hire a lawyer with a reputation who. Who, who cares about treating you well because mm -hmm. it's going to affect his reputation. And reputation is an extension of mm -hmm. the relationship, that is to say. Yeah. Now we are talking in the relation culture. 
it's it's pure pure relational contracting. So yep. it's uh, relationships and reputations are very important to mm -hmm. lawyers, and the extent to which they can get high legal fees depends a lot on their reputation and their relationships. Exactly. And it'll, that's always been true. We can't find a we can't find any substitute for it. Yep. But contingent fees are very helpful. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, with a contingent fee, you can you can find out a lot. And I will give you an example, mm -hmm. which uh, happened to me. Okay. Uh, you know, I started the company, the Berkeley Electronic Press, which does scholarly okay. communication mm -hmm. uh, online. Okay. It's, it's been a good, successful company. And yep. We uh, we applied for a patent. Okay. And the uh, the patent. Uh, the first, the preliminary work for the filing, I did myself. Okay. But then to take it to the next stage where you appeal the mm -hmm. judgment of the patent examiner mm -hmm. is expensive. You have to hire a lawyer. Yep. And the way it works is you list a series of claims mm -hmm. and the patent uh, lawyer then tries to get the patent examiner mm -hmm. to give you a patent on those claims. Yep. All right. Um, and so, what I asked the patent lawyer that was inter interviewing for the job was, mm -hmm. um, what do you think the probability is mm -hmm. that some of these claims mm -hmm. will result in a patent being issued? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, more than 50%. Okay. So he said, okay, more than 50%, I see. And if I hire you by, your, mm -hmm. by the hour, uh, you figure how many, you guess how many hours you'd work, about how much do you think this would cost me? Mm -hmm. And the person said, well, about $10,000. $10,000. Okay. $10, I said, okay, so you're saying that for $10,000 there's a 50% chance that I'll get mm -hmm. a patent. I said, okay, look, I'll tell you what, instead of paying you $10,000 mm -hmm. if I get a patent, mm -hmm. if, sorry, to try to get me a patent, why okay. don't we do this? I'll agree to pay you twenty-five thousand dollars if I actually if you actually get me a patent. Okay. And if you don't, I don't pay you anything. Okay. So you say the probability is fifty percent. Yep. Fifty percent of twenty-five thousand okay. is more than ten thousand. Okay. So you're better off, and I'm better off. Yep. Guess what? What happened? He wouldn't take it. Ah. Of course he wouldn't take it because he knew in his heart. That the probability was lower than twenty than fifty percent. So now he you knew that. reveal the real information. So he revealed the real information, so I didn't hire him. Oh, okay. I can understand that. So that's the advantage of uh, the contingent fee. You can make the lawyer tell you something. Yep. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, that's very useful when you try to use that to detect actually actual at least what he thinks. Yeah, and 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 I I was able to do that because I studied law and economics because he's a patent attorney, but he never had a client ask him that before. Okay, I understand now. Yeah, that, that's a very good example for law and economics. It you is, think it? in the possibility. Yeah. And then you think what you will gain, and also you consider the lawyer's fee. Yeah. And you put it into the consideration. <laughs> then you tell the lawyer. Yeah. Okay, you tell me that is like. A, the fifty percent winning yes. rate, then let's do it, and I give you a contingency fee. Yeah. But he denied. Yeah. It means that he already know that maybe the winning rate is lower than fifty percent. That's right. That's right. And there are um, there are lots of active buyers now mm -hmm. of patents where the lawyer buys the patent yeah. because the lawyer will pay you mm -hmm. as the patent holder for the right to collect the fees for when someone infringes your patent. Mm -hmm. And that's a good contract for you because mm -hmm. if the lawyer is if the lawyer if you sold the patent to the lawyer, okay. then what happens is the lawyer that that has solved the agency problem. The lawyer has got to decide whether to prosecute someone for mm -hmm. infringement or not to prosecute them for infringement. Mm -hmm. And now the lawyer is making the decision in the right way because he's considering mm -hmm. how much is it going to cost mm -hmm. 
in le f for me to spend the time mm -hmm. prosecuting this person and how much money am I going to get if yep. I win? Yep. He's balancing it all. Whereas yep. if it's if, if you own the patent and you come to him, yep. he's not going to tell you the truth. You know, he's going he's to say, oh yeah, sure, we'll get a lot of money from this case. <laughs> you just pay me and I'll, I'll prosecute the infringer. I, it's all a game, isn't it? It's, 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 that's very, it's a I think that's very inter institutional economics that you, who own the property right? That's right. That go, eventually, it's, you go it's back the, to... It's the straight, you know, the, the efficiency principle is the property right should be owned by the party who values it the most. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the, the person who's awarded the patent often doesn't value it the most Yep. Because he doesn't have the expertise to prosecute it. Yep. Whereas someone else who's a specialist in prosecuting patent infringement, mm -hmm. an attorney, that person will value the right more because he knows how to use, how to, he knows how to how to how to prosecute it, when to do it.